people like I used to be and others like me at big corporations spent a lot of money over the years uh, trying to get Americans to not trust their government or to think uh, of the government as just taking our money and, and not making very good use of it and politicians uh, not behaving as we would want them to behave. And I hate to admit, I was unwittingly a part of that to get Americans to distrust mm -hmm. the government. And it is why in, in many of the anti-health care reform campaigns, almost all of them, to be honest with you, regardless of what is being proposed, uh, my old industry uh, and its allies will say that what is being proposed is a government-run uh, health care system or is a uh, proposed government takeover of our health care system. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an extraordinary gentleman, Wendell Potter. In this crisis of health care, which has been boiling in the United States, I have not read or heard anybody more sensible. And so I'm very glad to have you here today. When we have a health care system, which the OECD says is more than double what most advanced economies pay per capita, and the World Health Organization ranks it something around 38th best in performance, we got work to do. I'm not, is how I say, there's some things wrong. I don't want to just growl. I want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why I asked you to join me today. But where are me? Where are we? Start. My dad was a doctor. Let's start with diagnosis. Then we'll get to remedies. Where are we now? Well, we're, we're very much in a, in a crisis mode. Uh, we all know, obviously, that we're in a pandemic, but we uh, are also in a, in a health care crisis that I don't think many people are aware of. Um, and it, uh, it shows up in many different ways. The companies that I used to work for are enormous companies now, far bigger than they were when, when I was there. Uh, they've grown so big largely because of public resources that in a, in a sense, the government is bailing them out and making them the monsters that they are now uh, and paying very little attention to what they're doing. Uh, one of the ramifications of, of uh, the growth of these companies uh, and, frankly, some of the work that I was doing before I left the industry, uh, people are uh, functionally uninsured in this country, people who think they have health insurance, but millions and millions and millions are, are finding out when it's, frankly, too late that their health insurance that they and their employers, in many cases, have been paying a lot of money for is just completely inadequate. And they, in many cases, wind up in bankruptcy or in debt for the rest of their lives, even with insurance. So it's a lot worse than it was when I left in many regards. Uh, I think there is some hope possibly, uh, even in the private sector, that some things can change that will disintermediate, if you will, uh, the big companies that I work for. They are big middlemen companies that extract enormous sums of money. Uh, in recent uh, years, the big health insurers, and I use that word in insurers uh, deliberately, but it's not really accurate anymore. Uh, they've they've uh, joined up, they've bought or been bought by other big parts of the healthcare system, primarily pharmacy benefit management companies, which is itself a big middleman. So you've got these enormous companies uh, that are even more in charge of our healthcare system than ever before. Two of those big companies are now in the Fortune Five in this country. Mm -hmm. And so it just goes to show you how big these companies have grown, how enormous they are, uh, and how well they are rewarding their shareholders while the rest of us are uh, uh, having a hard time getting the care that we need, even a harder time than ever before in, my, in, mm -hmm. in many cases. I saw recently you have a, a Substack column that I find very uh, nourishing. And uh, you've written about Anthem and you've written about United Healthcare recently and what proportion of their growth in profits seems to come from, from government, from Medicaid-like institutions. And uh, so it's, it's not what you might call willy-nilly in the private sector. And I imagine they're paying real close attention to the regulators who are appointed, 
to fundraisers for senators and congressmen and the kind of money in politics that you've written about in your books uh, seems, uh, how do you say, quite potent, quite dangerous. And then I guess I'll add an extra dimension that haunted me as I was preparing for this. They can charge you insurance premiums, but they can, in a kind of power discretionary way, cancel your coverage if you have a serious affliction on a kind of discretionary basis. They don't even have to honor ex post what ex ante you paid a lot of money for. It, it is true. Uh, it, it's not quite as blatant as it was before, or but it, it happens because of the way that insurance companies uh, have structured health benefit plans um, over the past several years. The Affordable Care Act sought to um, make illegal, and it did make illegal, some of the most egregious practices of health insurance companies. But I knew when the bill was passed that it was going to uh, set up a situation in which these big companies would would find other ways that they can make the profit margins and the earnings per share that investors expect them to make. And we've seen that play out. Uh, you're mentioning money in politics is 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 especially appropriate because it is at the heart of why we uh, can't make much progress mm -hmm. beyond the Affordable Care Act. And some would, would say that that didn't represent uh, a lot of progress. It represents some, in my opinion. But it also created or set up some unintended consequences, uh, one of which is enabling these big companies to have even a tighter grip on our health care system than ever before. And they do it largely because they spend so much money on campaign contributions and lobbying uh, at both the federal and state levels and even the local levels. They uh, spend a chunk of every dollar that we pay them uh, that it goes into a pot that then goes to lobbying and campaign contributions and propaganda campaigns like the ones that I used to help uh, develop and carry out. Yeah, I remember when I was younger, I started my career in the Republican Senate Budget Committee, working for Pete Domenici. And one day I was sitting on the floor with Bob Dole, who at the time was the majority leader. And he was quite an affable man. He came over and we were waiting about a half an hour before things started. And he said, well, what's on your mind being a senior economist and everything? I said, I don't understand why, because you're all concerned about budget discipline, these were during the Reagan years, and they'd done all the tax cuts and what have you. I said, you're, you guys are all concerned. Why don't you stop fundraising and make a public allocation for people to run for president and penalize the people who own the radio stations and so forth because you grant them their license? They should have to contribute some bandwidth as a public service for the elections. And if you take all the money out of politics, then people aren't gonna do so much pork and you can run a more balanced budget because you guys are having to run deficits to survive. And he started laughing. And then he looked at me and he said, darn, I just don't think it's feasible. And, uh, but, it, but it was kinda, of, he was playful about it. He wasn't offended and uh, but there, it just felt like the pork was running wild. And this is 84, 85, 86. And, uh, and it, it continues to run wild. I mean, there have been some, uh, uh, some, some things that have been done that, uh, in, that might limit the pork a little bit, but not, not very much. Mm -hmm. I was a reporter in Washington for a, a few years. Uh, just prior to that time, I was uh, covering... Congress and the White House for Scripps Howard newspapers back in the in the mid to the late seventies, and Howard Baker was the minority leader mm -hmm. and then majority leader at that time, and mm -hmm. I got to know him very well because he was from Tennessee and where I'm from. And um, at one point, this issue came up in a campaign of his, and he said, and his opponent said uh, that it uh, it would be great if um, if we had a system in which no one could. Uh, give me money unless they can vote for me. Uh, and uh, if we had a system like that in which no one other than the uh, people who could vote for you as a member of Congress yes. or a Senate, yes. it would 
it would uh, it would it would do a world of good. We wouldn't see this uh, rush of money that flows into every campaign from out of state uh, to uh, to buy these elections. Yeah. I'll uh, I have to protect his name, but there was a former senator who was a friend of mine, and when he retired, I went out to lunch with him, and I said, "Okay, you know, why are you doing this?" And he said, "Because I can't look in the mirror." when I spend 70% of my time raising money all around the country and the world to do things that harm my constituents that elected me. And he said, I, it's, it's obvious that for me to survive, I've got to do things that damage my constituents. I don't want to live like that. Wow. You know, that that's, that's very interesting. I, uh, uh, I had... I have sometimes said that when I finally decided I couldn't keep doing what I was doing uh, in the insurance business. It was be when I looked in the mirror and said, who are you? How did this happen to you? Uh, do you? This was not a career that you could ever have imagined. And certainly when I was a reporter, couldn't even comprehend doing what I ultimately wound up doing mm -hmm. as um, someone who's leading you know, the big PR shops of, uh, within enormous insurance companies. So that that's interesting. Just going to your, uh, what you might call your life trajectory. My name is Robert Johnson, so they talk about the crossroads uh, in the blues music with my namesake. So that's that's what I'm I'm getting at. You have uh, this experience in a Republican family in Tennessee. Your father, I believe, had fought in the war. And. Then you go to college in that 60s era. You become a journalist. You're, the product is illumination for the population of what's going on, which would interest them, I would, I would say, in an idealistic way. And then you, sh you make the shift for public relations for, I think it was Humana and then Cigna, and then you, after you do that, you live inside, you understand that, you break away. So I, I would say there are two crossroads I'm interested in. When you chose to go in to the insurance private sector, what was on your mind? What was the magnet? And when you chose to break out, what were the forces in play at that crossroad? You know, that I... I've never been asked that quite that way, uh, and I will have to admit that uh, for the first question, it was money, uh, an advancement in a career, uh, maybe attaining a lifestyle that I uh, aspired to attain mm -hmm. uh, that was more than my parents could ever have imagined. I mean, I think that was probably more of what was on my mind than anything else. Ultimately, later, though, the reason I left that was I've it was a crisis of conscience. It was a realization that I was chasing something that was um, uh, would have embarrassed my parents. Would have uh, uh, they would have been so ashamed to a certain extent of knowing uh, what I was doing for a living and how I had changed from the, the you know the, the 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 boy who had grown up in their household. Uh, and I think that my coming from from that family from that part of the country played a huge role in my ultimate decision to to walk away i i found myself in a situation which i um, had to face people who could have been people i grew up with who were waiting to get care in in barns and animal stalls um, and i probably wouldn't have had that reaction had i not grown up mm -hmm. in a uh, quite frankly a uh, up, um, uh, a low-income, working-class family, uh, uh, a farming family in, in a small rural area of Tennessee. So at some level at this, this second crossroads, which I think is, is very tender in it, I think it has a lot to do with what you've done since, you reached a place of conflictedness between what you were being asked to do on behalf of the company and what the company and in the context of our political economy, was doing to people? 
That's exactly right. I, I had this realization that what I was being paid quite well to do in my corporate career at these insurance companies was the exact opposite of what I tried to do in my career as a journalist. And I mm. was always proud of that career, even though I left it at a fairly young age. I never wanted to, and never did, intentionally mislead anyone with anything that I wrote as a journalist. Never, to my knowledge, left anything out to obscure anything that was important or relevant uh, just to make a point in any story that I wrote or even any commentaries that I wrote. But I realized uh, that's what I was being paid precisely to do uh, in my job mm -hmm. at, at Humana and then, and then Cigna was to mislead people, was to present um, some facts and figures and purposely leaving some other facts and figures out uh, that, uh, uh, that, that were very important for people to know. And doing this to enhance shareholder value, that was exactly what it mm -hmm. was. Uh, that is the one thing that is most important for these companies. And it's not certainly unique to uh, the health insurance business. But if you are a, um, a if you are an executive of a company whose stock is is on the New York Stock, if you're a New York Stock Exchange company uh, or publicly owned company, that's uh, for most of these companies. That's what drives them. And uh, I saw that um, up close. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. that uh, the position I had gave me visibility into corners of the business that most people don't get. For that, there is there is that. And I just could not continue doing it mm -hmm. uh, uh, and looking myself in the mirror and, 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 and remembering who I was, how I was raised, and what I tried to do in my first career. Well, that's beautiful. I, uh, I think there's, there's a very interesting dilemma, which I once heard you explore with Paul Jay on the Real News Network, and that was... When you had this consciousness that things were off course in terms of a moral purpose, you said you realized that you couldn't stay and reform from within, that you would be distanced as opposed to going outside, writing books, shedding light, carrying the expertise from your experience, which gives you credibility. But that was the only way to make the difference. That's true. I, I came to realize there is is not possible to change things from within these big companies. And I would go so far as to say even the CEO uh, and the executive suite really can't do that. Uh, if you're in a company that is large and has uh, uh, shareholders that essentially are large institutional investors, uh, there is no way that you can change a company in this, in a way that is significantly different from what your your few competitors are doing, mm -hmm. and we've seen that play out in just recent days. I've I've, I've also written a piece about Cigna's recent earnings report or re the report of earnings mm -hmm. for 2021. Uh, uh, Aetna more recently announced, and if you look at all of uh, both Aetna and Cigna's announcements, you'll see that they did very very well in 2021, but uh, Wall Street wasn't happy with what they were saying that they thought they would be earning in 2022. So both of those companies got big hits on their stock prices mm. Uh, mm. on the day that they announced earnings. A significant uh, uh, loss of market capitalization just because they were signaling or saying that they uh, uh, expected to earn X in 2022, and that was a bit less than what Wall Street's financial analyst we're expecting those companies to do. Hmm. Um, so it's all about the expectations mm -hmm. of these big invest investors. It's not so much about, well, thank you for making us so rich last year. How rich are you going to make us this year? Right. That's what uh, really controls mm -hmm. uh, these companies. And, uh, um, and I was in a position to observe that, to see that play out day in and day out. My name was on every earnings release at Cigna for 10 years. So I, I know um, uh, what motivates the CEOs and the uh, CFOs, the investor relations people, because those are their bosses. And the other thing is they have a vested interest in pleasing Wall Street because certainly the CEO, uh, his or her compensation 
is so tied to the financial performance of the company. I was one of my talking points when I was having to try to justify the CEO's salary was that uh, 90% of his compensation was, as we, we call it, at risk, which meant that, yeah, he made, uh, his salary was like one or two million dollars a year, but uh, he made a lot more than that through stock grants and stock mm -hmm. options that mm -hmm. the company gave him. And that was depending on how well he led the company to meet Wall Street's expectations. Yeah. And uh, if, if you had a day like Cigna and had and, and Aetna had recently, uh, their compensation took a big, big hit because they're shareholders as well too. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's something I don't think people realize. The people who run these companies, uh, they have uh, financial interest. Their net worth fluctuates depending on how well they are leading those companies to meet the needs and expectations of, of one stakeholder, and that stakeholder is the shareholder. Yeah. I always tell people that I used to work in the, uh, I was in the hedge fund industry for a number of years, that the song that I thought companies should sing to themselves was an uh, old soul song by the Shirelles called, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? Yesterday uh, never mattered anymore. Never mattered. Will you still love it's me tomorrow? Perfect. <laughs> and, uh, it's perfect. It's absolutely the truth. Uh, and, and it changes in a minute. I mean, yeah. it's not been so long ago that we uh, were looking at 2021 mm -hmm. and how, how well uh, investors did. But yeah, what have you done for me? What are you going to do for me now? Yeah. Well, the dilemmas that you raise about not being able to repair inside so you leave, you wrote Deadly Spin, an insurance company insider speaks out on how corporate PR is killing health care and deceiving Americans. I think it was 2010, 2011, around that time. It was 20, it was yeah. uh, uh, toward the end of 2010. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I bought that book from my dad, by the way, at the time. Oh, good. And, well, thank uh, you. But, the, uh, but I guess where I want to go with this, the, the dilemma is, okay, you can't repair on the inside. Now you come outside. When you're outside, something has to change the contours in which the company performs to get it to change. Your book in 2016 is called Nation on the Take, How Big Money Corrupts Our Democracy and What We Can Do About It. So I want to say, you're now outside. From inside, you can't reform them. How can you get government, which is on the take from big donations, to enact the reforms this society needs. And where I'm going to take this is if they can't do it, that despair, that frustration, that unfairness will destroy the credibility of government, the credibility of expertise, and I would say fans the flames of the attraction of authoritarian demagoguery. And I think we are in the midst of that right now. So. How do, how do you take from coming out, how do I say, bearing witness with expertise, but then seeing the systemic problems, what kind of recipe can you and I concoct to put us on a healthier trajectory? Well, first of all, I share your, your concern. Uh, and, and, and I think it is, be, well, another reason why uh, is that people like, I used to be, and others like me, at big corporations spent a lot of money over the years uh, trying to get Americans to not trust their government or to think uh, of the government as just taking our money and, and not making very good use of it and politicians uh, not behaving as we would want them to behave. Um, and, and there was a, a purpose for that, and that was to get people to think that any kind of government regulations, for example, would be a bad thing and that taxes are a bad thing because big companies uh, try to avoid both as much as possible. So they've done a very, very good job. And I hate to admit I was unwittingly a part of that to get Americans to distrust mm -hmm. the government. And it is why in, in many of the anti-health care reform campaigns, almost all of them, to be honest with you, regardless of what is being proposed, uh, my old industry uh, and its allies will say that what is being proposed is a government-run 
uh, health care system or is a uh, proposed government takeover of our health care system. Those, those terms uh, uh, were used and are continued, uh, still used because of just what that dynamic that I described. Uh, uh, big corporations have uh, really over decades got us to think the way we do about our government. Mm -hmm. And it's getting worse, as you said, because uh, the way that our political system has evolved, some to a certain extent because of Supreme Court decisions that have uh, made it even more uh, likely that big corporations will call the shots, because of that, people are frustrated, and they're seeing that uh, our, the people that we elect to represent our interest are not able to deliver on, on their promises. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are so easily, uh, I think, confused about what is in our best interest and so gullible uh, because of changes in, in the way we get our news and information. It's almost setting up a, 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 a perfect storm that can make it much more likely, I think, that we would we will be drifting into an authoritarian kind of uh, regime for, for who knows how long. Yeah. And it worries me a great deal uh, because it is at the heart uh, of what what problem is, is all the money that is awash in our political system that keeps uh, change from happening and to protect a status quo that is extraordinarily profitable for a few of the incumbent industries and companies. Yeah, I, I recommend a book. Uh, there's a scholar at Columbia University who had come out of Sh University of Chicago named Bernard Harcourt. And the name of his book is The Illusion of Free Markets. And what, in essence, kind of the meta perspective is that capitalism gets its moral license from being embedded in a democracy. But when the institutions have to be managed and the servant becomes the master, the contortions and the distortions don't look anything like that free market competitive model that's used in academic world to justify this system. Simplest answer is, or simplest window in is when you don't, in, you don't enforce antitrust then you're not dealing with a competitive market any longer. But there are many, many dimensions in which you might call uh, contradictions to those underlying simplistic assumptions that makes it very, very uh, important that something be there, which we'll call government, to shape things. One of the things that haunts me and, and some of our friends uh, through Guy Saperstein have been able to explore is the notion that the left has lost confidence in government. It used to be there was a team that worshiped free markets and there was a team that kind of what I'll call had FDR nostalgia, Lyndon Johnson nostalgia and said, we believe in the government, a mixed economy the Pollyanni's great transformation about creating balance. Then there's the free market people. There was a man named Stuart Zeckman, who was a musical uh, writer. And Carol uh, Avedon, I think, shared with us that he had done a podcast years ago where an Obama official who was unnamed was on Politico. And this Obama official said, you can't pretend we're in an environment anymore like Franklin Roosevelt. People don't believe in government. And Zeckman, who was, I believe, a musician, went and looked at the Gallup surveys from which this anonymous individual was quoting uh, his evidence and found that the people on the left didn't believe in the free market because they believed that the government was captured by the corporate sector. And... I remember just feeling like, uh, how, how do you say, understanding the disparagement of government or the uh, notion of inefficiency that came from watching the Soviet Union or uh, 
part windows of Maoist history in China, got transformed into disparaging a necessary condition for a healthy political economy in the United States. And I, I think I, we got a lot of work to do now. We really do. And I think there's, uh, there's reason to have that concern if you are on the left of seeing just how big corporations uh, and large special interests have, have captured government, have captured the, the, uh, the regulatory apparatus, and certainly uh, control the, the electoral process to a certain extent, to a large extent, more than I think most people realize because of the way that they can just uh, pretty much call the shots when someone's running for, camp for, a, for elected office. Uh, uh, and, and certainly through the enormous sums of money that are spent to influence public policy. When the Affordable Care Act was being debated, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry spent more during that time lobbying uh, Congress and the White House than any industry had ever spent uh, on any prior legislation. Uh, but we're seeing that now, as, you know, those records are being uh, 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 challenged uh, just about every year um, as members of Congress try to look at where do we go from here. Um, and I think uh, progressives are seeing that even at the state level where there has been hope that maybe uh, progress could be made there, uh, those, those hopes are dashed. But, and again, it is because of money that is... Uh, controlling the, the actions of the people that we vote for. Mm -hmm. Well, in your recent work, I know you're starting, how do I say, activism on a number of fronts that you'd shared with me uh, in an earlier conversation. The Center for Health and Democracy, Business Leaders for Healthcare Transformation, and uh, one, I think you called it loops or lupin. Uh, what was it? Uh, lower out of pocket now. Yeah, lower out of pockets now. Yeah, and the acronym yeah. is loop. And and so yeah. I can see. How would I say? You're not giving up the fight. We talked a little bit from a kind of what I might say mildly despondent perspective of capture in the discouragement that Zekman uncovered. What are, you, what are you doing in these organizations to, uh, to carry on? Well, um, they are distinct. One, uh, I'll start with the business group first. Business Leaders for Healthcare Transformation seeks to bring the, the voice of, of business leaders, uh, particularly those uh, uh, that are concerned about uh, the cost of health insurance or providing coverage to their workers and, and also many employers that just have long ago been priced out of the uh, health insurance market. They can't, they can't afford to offer coverage to their workers. So that is an organization that uh, tries to make sure that policymakers and the public broadly understands that, that there is a large swath of uh, our business community that, that is not in league with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and outfits like the National Federation of Independent Business, which purport to represent the interest of, of businesses in this country. They don't. And I know that because uh, in my old job, I used to work uh, very closely with those organizations to get them to carry out our propaganda campaigns. And they'll do it for a dollar, you know, for well, more than a dollar. Uh, it costs quite a bit to get those uh, organizations to carry water for you. But that's what happens. So with that organization, we are looking to bring the business voice to helping to find some solutions to make our healthcare system more rational. Center for Health and Democracy, the word democracy is very important for the reasons we've, we've been talking about. Uh, what can we do through that organization to uh, help people understand just how uh, our political system has been taken over by the special interest, the big corporations, the big industries, uh, and that's why we have this healthcare system that we have and why it is so hard for those that we vote for to make uh, any improvements in it. Uh, 
we, uh, as part of that work this year, will be looking at campaign contributions at both the state and federal level to show, for example, which Democrats are taking money from the political action committees or the big companies like the ones I used to work for. Uh, just within recent days, we saw that my old industry, uh, the health insurance business, through one of its front groups called the Better Medicare Alliance, uh, uh, crow about getting 340 members of Congress to sign a bill, uh, uh, sign a letter uh, to the Secretary of HHS and uh, the Administrator for the, the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services uh, to protect Medicare Advantage, to make sure that that is funded uh, because Americans love it so much. Uh, that's an example of how they are able to get politicians in their pockets. They gave money to these uh, members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike. Uh, it gives them the opportunity in the industry to say this is bipartisan support for Medicare Advantage. When what's really going on here is uh, keeping a cash cow being fed. The Medicare Advantage program in particular is the new cash cow for these big companies. And that is where, in many cases, we as taxpayers are bailing out these big insurance companies. They are no longer growing uh, on the private side, on the commercial side. In fact, uh, their, their membership in the uh, employer-sponsored plans and other plans that people buy on their own has been diminishing for years. Now, most of their money is coming from us as taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we uh, try to expose all that to educate the public, uh, to put pressure on policymakers, but also uh, to, we, what, one of the things I want to do going forward is also to shine a light on some things that, that, that's going on in the private sector that might, uh, uh, might make some things better for us uh, in certain regards. Uh, it, because it is so hard to change uh, policy and, and to influence uh, policy makers, I think it's, it's, it's important to look at what can be done in the private sector to, um, to disintermediate the big companies that I used to work for. And I think that's a possibility. I think we need to focus attention on both the public and the private sectors to, uh, to change our healthcare system. If we just uh, look to try to influence legislation, I'm just afraid that we're not going to be able to make much progress. We haven't seen much progress over the past several years because of, again, all the money that the incumbents are able to uh, throw into the system to protect their profits. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. Uh, we have a lot of young people still in school. I look at universities today. Let's, I'll speak about California public school system, University of Michigan, University of Virginia. The public support for education is down. Lots of pharmaceutical and healthcare companies are doing laboratories at major universities as a source of revenue. There's a lot of, uh, how would I say, wealthy donors and alumni who worked in the healthcare industry. Are we illuminating these dilemmas in university curriculum to the degree that we need to so that people are preparing to become citizens, people are preparing to address these challenges in lockstep with your efforts? Or is this is this a one of those silences that anthropologists tell you study the silences because the silences reveal where the truth is and where the power is and they're not in the same place oh they're not i think that's uh that's really an important question uh also worries me a great deal i've i i, I, I even um, at the level before college i think that we long ago have have uh stop teaching civics, uh, top, stop uh, providing uh, 
training and information about how to be a good corporate, a good uh, civic uh, uh, participant uh, and a good citizen. Uh, and I don't think you're seeing that, that, that at the college level as much as, as is needed and what we might, would have, might have seen in years past. Um, um, the, I think the, the whole idea of a, a liberal education is, is one that probably is not as attainable as it, as it once might have been. I think there is too much of an emphasis on training people to go into the workforce, to do X job. Mm-hmm. And not nearly enough focus on uh, making sure that someone has critical thinking skills, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and I think that has been a significant change in our educational system over the years. That is uh, uh, a really dangerous, dangerous change in our in our system. I I, I think it is it is why so many people or a, a reason why so many people are so gullible, so why they are so easily persuaded to believe things that are not true. They're not equipped to think critically mm-hmm. and to understand how they're being taken advantage of. It's hard to, to understand that in the first place, but in the absence of any kind of training about how to do it, um, I think we're going to be sunk. Yeah, the late uh, and very famous Canadian author Jane Jacobs' last book was published in 2004. It was called Dark Age Ahead. And the third chapter was called Credentializing versus Educating. And I remember reading that feeling quite uh, unsettled. But I think there's another dimension now, which is when people are at that place between learning curiosity on one side and credentials on the other, part of what drives them towards the credentials is the fear of economic insecurity if they aren't conformist. And so we're, we're not in a, uh, what you might call, a free environment. And this anxiety, will I have health care? Can I afford a car? All these kind of things in this advanced nation often relates to the kind of data that the Economic Policy Institute in Washington puts out, which is productivity has been going up And more than 100% of the gains have gone to essentially about 8% of the population. The median income in America is lower than it was in the mid-1980s, according to those studies. And so something's happening in terms of distribution inside that's heightening fear. And I remember uh, there's a wonderful psychologist named Howard Gardner, who I've never met at Harvard, And he wrote a story once in the Washington Post about why cheating is so rampant at his university called Harvard. He said, you'd think these people are already on the conveyor belt to success. But he said the stakes between being in the one-tenth of one percent and even in the 10 to 20th percent were so high that many people took the risk of cheating and being caught in order to which you might call propel their their credentials and record to a higher level. And I thought that was that was really an interesting symptom of the anxiety which young people face in the world today. I think you're right. I think that, that, that uh, one thing that might seem and hopefully could counter that uh, is from what I am hearing and reading, maybe more. Uh, of a sense of social justice among millennials and people who are younger, and maybe less uh, a feeling of being driven to uh, have a house that's bigger than our parents or uh, the the you know the the biggest most expensive car model. Uh, maybe maybe that can help counter that. But I think it, you, but I think it is is is, is absolutely right. The, the in, economic insecurity is. Uh, is a very big thing and a very real thing at all levels of our society, unless you uh, are pretty well assured of of uh, uh, being left a lot of money by your your parents, uh, and it also is leading uh, leading I think to uh, something called uh, diseases of despair in this country, uh, in which people are, uh, are almost hopeless. Uh, they they can't see how they can get ahead, uh, and uh, 
uh, they they work in many cases two or three jobs and uh, it's just not working out for them. Uh, they're not and, and and they're seeing things on social media and on TV and other other traditional media about uh, things that others may have or that uh, they should have but they don't. And I think it just really leads to these diseases of despair and contributes to the fact that our um, our lifespan in this country is actually shortening <laughs> rather than, than, than increasing.